you all here for a very special lecture by a very special guest this morning, uh, Arno Montagut, who is a senior or established researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and a longtime collaborator with us uh, on a number of things, uh, including, uh, for example, some high performance extensions for you know, by MPI for super duper ridiculously large business cell simulations on supercomputers. And uh, today, uh, talking about a collaboration that they have been leading jointly with the Institute Curie on uh, Physiboss, which integrates MaBoss Boolean agents with Physicel to get Boolean networks inside of individual cell agents, which lets you to do a lot of cool things that you're just about to see. And uh, I'm really, you know, it's kind of a special, this work has a special place in my heart because it is the first official add on for Physicel and is supported across platform. And it reaches out. Um, this all began several years ago. Regal Latorte at uh, Institute Curie found our preprint on Physicel before it was even published in Pulse Competition Biology. And we reached out and said, hey, we have Boolean agents. Would you like to integrate them? And I said, that sounds wonderful. And then they disappeared. And I was afraid that that was dead. And then they came back and said, hey, we're done. So it was just the, you know, the ama amazing power of open science and of preprints and amazing collaborators who just reach out and get things done. It was wonderful. And we've had just this, this beautiful, fruitful collaboration with them and then with Barcelona Supercomputing Center for really the last two, three, four years. And uh, this has really kind of been at the core of turning Physicel from you know, a lab project that we had for fun and then releases open source to now that something that's really truly a community. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Arnaud and I am so excited for this talk. And this will be recorded and slides will be available uh, on the workshop website and on the public uh, YouTube channel for Physicel. So Arno, please take it away. Oh, oh I'm yes, sorry, so one last thing. Uh, in terms of format, uh, we, we ask that you please hold your questions and instead type them in the chat window and I will moderate your questions. And uh, every now and then we'll take a break uh, or pause, and I will read out some of the questions for Arno to answer. And then anything we don't answer afterwards, Arno, I think uh, has, I think Arno is now in Gathertown, and so maybe you can find him in the fountain area after the talk uh, to to answer questions, and of course in the Slack workspace. So thank you so much, Arno. Please take it away. Yes, thank you very much for for the nice introduction and and for uh, giving me the opportunity to deliver these, uh, I've been showing you some of the things that, that we have done and that, that we are doing and that we plan to do. Uh, so that, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we I mean, this, this snowballing effect of community get, gets bigger and bigger. So uh, let me just introduce very, very briefly uh, myself. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a bachelor and master's in biology and I did my PhD in applied maths in, in Valencia in two different universities in my hometown. And then I moved to Paris to, to Institut Curie for, for a postdoc under, a, under the, the guide of, of Emmanuel Barillo, which the group was called Systems Biology of Cancer. So there, the, the, the main focus, the idea was to build Boolean models on, on gene interactions. And, and this, I mean, in, in this, doing this postdoc is when, when, when we discovered, the Gael discovered this preprint of, of Physicel 1.00. So we said, okay, let, let's give it a try. And, and yeah, so it was, it, was very, it was very exciting and it was very, very nice. And at the end, we, we ended up uh, working with multi-skill models of cancer uh, from the perspective, I mean, our starting point was working on, on stochastic simulations of, of Boolean networks, of, of gene interaction networks that I will briefly introduce. And, and then in late 2018, I moved to Barcelona to, to BSC under, under the guide of Alfonso Valencia. Uh, and there we, I mean, we have the opportunity to work with, with one, of the, one of the supercomputers in Europe, which is the one that I have here uh, behind my back, uh, which, is, which is called Mare Nostrum. And there have been several, several versions of Mare Nostrum. Current is number four, and we're waiting for number five that will come sometime, sometime the end of this year or beginning of, of following year. And, and the idea is to use the power of this supercomputer in order to have huge simulations. So the idea is not to simulate a few hundred cells, but to simulate a real size tumor of I don't know, thousand million cells or, or, or thousand billion cells. I mean, as big as you can imagine. And of course, for that, I mean, we want to have cellular heterogeneity. We want to have environmental heterogeneity. We want to have cell evolution and we don't want to have different kinds of interactions between different cell types. So this is, let's say, the main, the main goal. So uh, if you're ever in, in Barcelona and there's not a pandemic around, so please uh, come visit us. Uh, so this is the old building that is, I think it's 14, 14th century. And this is the new building that they just they just have finished a few weeks ago or months ago. 
And whenever, whenever the pandemic is over, we'll go back to the offices. I think it's fourth floor on this corner, more or less. But yeah, I mean, this is this is one of the nice towns of uh, one, one, one of the nice parts of Barcelona. Uh, well, Barcelona is all of it is nice, but this is one of the nicest places. So yeah, it, it's fully surrounded by by, by gardens, etc. I mean, it's very very nice place to work. At. So yeah, just just few numbers of of Mare Nostrum. I mean, this is a general purpose supercomputer, meaning that it's not focused in one single in one single purpose in one single focus. So for instance, we have different departments at PSC. We have life sciences, we have earth, we have uh, also computer computer science, of course, and and we have also applications. So people that that go there because they want to have an app or they want to they want to analyze some kind of movement of, of mobile phones, whatever. So the idea is that already in Mare Nostrum 4, we kind of like like uh, had like a, just a, a tidy bit of new technologies that was called uh, when already when it was when it was built in I think it was five years ago, and one of those are GPUs. I mean we have we have GPUs, we have uh, cell phone processors, etc. So uh, in in the case that, that you're interested into into using uh, like these these other kinds of of, of architectures, you, we can also we can also provide that that service or you can you can use this. The problem sometimes is that sometimes we're asked to transition some of our tools to GPUs, and then we say okay yeah but this is this is a lot of work. I mean maybe it's not worthwhile. Maybe we'll just start over with another another app in order to in order to use this. But yeah, so anyway, I mean this is this is Marina Storm 4. Of course, the Marina Storm 5 will be will be a bit different. In fact, we, we still don't know how it will be. So yeah, that, that will be that would be a, a surprise. So this is this is the supercomputer. It it it, it is inside an old uh, church. In fact, it was a chapel that was desacralized uh, several several years ago. So that's why it looks like like a church, because basically it was used as a church. And uh, yeah, so so uh, several. I mean, I think it was like 30 years ago. It was not used anymore as a church. So the university bought it, and then it reconverted into into different spaces. So good thing is that also Mare Nostrum does does not only inspire science, but if you're into uh, if you're into this kind of literature, the last book for the all, second to last book from Dan Brown, it's called Origin. And one of the main one of the main uh, um, uh, characters is a researcher in in supercomputing. And it, I mean, and you have Mare Nostrum, Mare Nostrum 4 is, is, I mean, is depicted in the book in several parts of it. So, yeah, I mean, we, all, we, can, we can also prove this is not only science based, but also uh, literature uh, um, inspiring. So, anyway, uh, you, you need to know, I mean, maybe people, be, maybe people in the US don't know, but, but the, the way that, that we in Europe we have different supercomputers is in a grid fashion, I mean, in the sense that uh, we don't concentrate all the efforts or all the countries don't concentrate the efforts in one single supercomputer in one of the countries, else there might be trouble. But what we have is several supercomputers around in different in different uh, countries so that depending on what you want to use, you can you can address yourself to the technical people of this or that or that um, supercomputer and then they, they kind of like direct you to, to how to use their, their cluster. So we have one in Barcelona, we have, we have one in Paris at Curie. Uh, we have one in, I think, is Milan, and we have one in in Switzerland, and then also in Germany there are there are I think two or three more. So this is this is quite quite distributed and quite quite uh, the, yeah, it's quite uh, dispersed. Let's say. So one of the questions that that come from time to time is like, okay, I mean, why why do we need a bigger cal calculator? I mean, don't 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 do don't we have enough with the, with the calculators we have already? So the thing is that um, I mean, we have seen, for instance, with with artificial intelligence studies that that. The, the bigger infrastructure you have, you can address different problems and you can find solutions that use those uh, bigger architectures in innovative ways. So uh, in this way, we have seen that, that uh, uh, AI computing power and sorry, computing power and AI progress have been hand to hand in the last, in the last few years. And we have seen that we have, uh, that, that we, can, we can train uh, much, much, more, uh, much more networks of AI networks using, using these, these new architectures than we had before. So of course this is a bit like chicken or egg. I mean, it's not like like okay. I mean, why do we need a bigger computer in order to have our own our our present code? But usually having these different computer or different architecture will lead you to have different code, and this different code may address the problem differently and maybe more efficiently. Hopefully, uh, more efficiently. So, with uh, with that in mind, uh, just an extremely brief introduction into into biology and and why uh, do we do we consider that that we need these kind of architectures in order to solve all our problems. Uh, starting 2000 with the genomic, with the genomic the human genome sequencing, we have been like 15, 16 years of what we could call an omics revolution. I mean, the, the, the molecular biology that you would do 
before 2000 and after 2000 has, I mean, it's, it's nothing comparable. So uh, this is this has been going. I mean, it's still ongoing. I mean, to be honest, in 2021, you still have omics data around and and, and the more uh, much more uh, omics data than before. Uh, but starting 2016, and I would say peaking in in 18, 19, maybe now. I mean, now that you still have uh, fine papers on on this, is single cell omics data. So now uh, before you could have omics data of a patient. Now you have the omics data of all the cells of that patient. So instead of having one matrix for one patient, you have thousands of matrices for one patient. So as you can imagine, this, this increases data a, a thousandfold. And then the way that you need to analyze this data is different. I mean, you need different tools and you need, you need different ways of addressing it. So um, in, order, in order to, I mean, following this, it has been stated that, that, uh, um, that molecular biology in the following 10 years will have like a leap in quantity of data that we can use. So, of course, the problem is, okay, what, what are we going to do with that tsunami of data? I mean, how are we going to address that data and how we can get uh, knowledge out of that information? Because sometimes you have, I mean, sometimes, most of the times you have a gap between information gathering and, and gathering knowledge out of that information. So in order to address, in order to have to, to bridge this gap, uh, usually in biology, we talk about, about like, like four different structures of organizing data. And usually the kind of data that you can gather leads you to different kinds of structure. So we have interaction networks, for instance, protein-protein uh, networks. You have activity flows in which you have signaling pathways or gene regulatory networks. In fact, here, I mean, if, if this is activated, then this will lead to the activation of something or to the inhibition of something else. Interaction network is just A and B go together, and that's it. Process description, which is a bit more detailing, which you have, you have like, like a bipartite graph in which you have like an intermediate state that mediates the transition between one and another. And then entity relationships, which is the most detailed one in which you specify the, the amino acid that is being transformed in this transformation, et cetera. So depending on each one of those structures, this structure will lead to some, kind, some, some different modeling. So for instance, in activity flow, we usually model biological modeling. So if A is activated, then B will be, it will be inhibited or the other way around. With PPI, usually we use statistical modeling. So what happens if I just remove this node? And then I see that all these other clusters form around. Process description, you usually you, have, you can describe it with ODEs if you have lots of data for your problem, or with flux balance analysis if you're working with, with metabolism. And then entity relationships usually are addressed by rule-based rule -based model. So as you can imagine, I mean, if you gather different kinds of knowledge, this will lead to different structure and this will lead to different model. This doesn't mean that it's good or bad. I mean, it's just different. I mean, the nature of the data will lead you to different, to different, to different kind of model or the other way around. If I have a project that I want to study this kind of, of modeling, then I will need to gather this, this uh, kind of data. So having this like a, a, a somewhat brief introduction into, into biology, the main motivation of, of our modeling in, in using, using PhysiCell, PhysiBoss and whatnot is cancer. I mean, we, we came into this field in order to study cancer. And what we want to study is how the different stepwise processes of cancer lead to an abnormal growth. So we know that something happens in the cell, we know that something happens in the environment, and we know that something happens in the, in the interaction between those two, so that you have this abnormal growth. Sometimes it happens in the cell and that's it, and we know there are some cases where the mutation of one given cell, that's it. I mean, this is, this is just, the, just the triggering of, of all the cancer. Sometimes not. I mean, sometimes you are, uh, the, the cell is helped by other cells, etc. So um, the, the, yeah. so the idea of, of having this multi-scale model is in order to tackle this, this kind of problems. Right? So we want some kind of cell heterogeneity. We want interaction between cells. Uh, we want to be able to study mutants in this, one, in this kind of heterogeneities, et cetera. So <coughs> yeah, now there was a bit of, of introduction into agent-based modeling, but I'm pretty sure that all, all our listeners will know this by heart. So just, just so you know that, that we're using that we're using PhysiCell as, as the agent-based framework. I see that hard there. So yeah, the idea is uh, you know that that, that PhysiCell, I mean you have you have different agents, the agents have different properties. You have also a, 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 a description of the environment, which is a, a very explicit description of the environment. As you need to solve it somehow, you just voxelize the environment and then you have these these voxels in which in which you, you discretize the different space in order to know what is the, the diffusion of each one of the concentration, each one of the voxels, et cetera. 
So uh, this this gave us the, the the ability to play around with, uh, with with the agents and the environment and to play around with these with the different dispositions, etc. But one of the things that 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 we, we we liked a lot about about these kind of multi-scale modelings is this one is the time scales. I mean, in fact, we call it multi-scale because we have different time scales. So the idea is that you have a time scale of diffusion, you have a time scale of cell movement, and you have a time scale of cell processes. So depending on what you're studying, you will modify things that are, are in one time scale or another. And as you can imagine, uh, those time scales, I mean, feed each other. I mean, of course, if if the, the delta of diffusion is bigger, then you will have some some other behaviors. So you need you need to fine tune this pretty well in order to make sense uh, to the things that that, that that you are doing. So. Yeah, so this is this is the slide I have since maybe uh, maybe not ten, but maybe five years ago. In the sense of what, what is I mean, what is our end goal? I mean, what do we want? At the at, I mean at the end at the end of, of our career, we would like to have like a multi-scale modeling in which it's a, let's say a toy or a tool, whatever what you want to call it, that has different inputs that are relevant to our to our study. So for instance, you have inputs that come from the environment, like okay, I mean how many, uh, what are the hormones that I have around? What is the density of the extracellular matrix that I have around? We, we want to be able to play with mutations in this multi-scale framework. So we want to be able to have uh, this, this epithelial cell that is slightly different than its neighbor because it had some, some mutation. We want also to play with the different parameters of the cells with environment. So cell cell adhesion and the cell adhesion to the extracellular matrix. So we want to integrate all these data into, into this tool in order to be able to answer questions around what are the gene mutations that I need to do in this in this in this uh, in this uh, model, so that I will have this kind of invasion or this kind of metastasis or this kind of cancer, and also I mean in order to have this you need to know signaling pathways and you need to be able to simulate signaling pathways, but also you need to in, to be able to simulate the interaction between the cell and the environment, and also if you have of course uh, changes in the environment that that at the end affect somehow the the cell. So this is uh, this comes from a paper from 2011 in which in which two authors described the different kinds of invasion that you have in epithelial cancer. So you see that there are single cell invasion, which is the the, the, the first two. Then you have like few cells invasion, which is the the, fourth, the third and the fourth. And then you have like clusters of cells. And this is something that they see in epithelial cancers. Of course, if you go to to people that specialize in breast cancer, they say, oh, type number four doesn't exist in breast cancer. In 30 years of, of, of looking for breast cancer, I've never seen that one. Okay, maybe these kinds of these types will change, but the the causes of how you get those those different types of cells, I mean, can only come from the cells, from the environment, and from the interaction of those two. So what what we want to have at the end is this this tool that that allow us to have like like different kinds of different kinds of behavior of the cancer depending on on some on some uh, biological and also some physical some physical uh, data that we can have from the cancer. Uh, and of course, I mean, this, this can go different ways. If you know the inputs and you know the, and you know the tool, then you kind of like simulate the different outputs, or you can like, like, like reverse engineer with the, all the inputs and all the outputs. You can, you can modify then the model with something that, that, that tackles, uh, that tackles your, your problem. So for this, I mean, this, this was the idea behind merging my boss with PhysiCell. So uh, PhysiCell, we know that is the agent-based uh, framework for stimulating multicellular uh, systems. And MABOS it, it is a tool that was developed in, at, at the group in, in Curie where I arrived in 2012, in which they, they want to model stochastically Boolean models. So the idea was to introduce uh, this, uh, let's say, intracellular simulation inside the agents, and that, of course, the agents will be affected by the environment. So, of course, very cleverly, we just gathered the first, the first um, few letters of Fizi and then the last few letters of Boss, and then we got, we got Fizi Boss. So, <laughs> yes, this was, this was also like a non-brainer. Like, okay, I mean, it's obvious that, that, that it has to be called this. So, the idea is that this Fizi Boss uh, is a Fizi cell extension that includes cellular signaling. In our case, cellular signaling is simulated by Boolean models. But it could be otherwise. It could be you could have intracellular models of, of ODEs with other with other extensions or with with metabolic modeling with other extensions, etc. So uh, just um, uh, maybe before going into the primer, we can take some questions if uh, you want, Paul. Or should I continue yeah, just uh, a bit? Actually, right now we haven't gotten any questions. Okay, 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 okay. We can take them. Maybe we should go ahead and continue. Okay, okay, okay. So let's, yeah. Okay, let's, so oh, let's, let's. That was a great way to pause. That was exactly right. 
<laughs> Great. So okay, so let, let's let's move on with logical formalism. So when we talk about Boolean models or logical models, what we talk about is an interaction an interaction graph in which you have you have different different entities that that interact with each other, and the kinds of interactions that they have is either activation or inhibition, and you can have basically two states, active or inactive. Sometimes we call uh, there are logical models that are not Boolean that have multi-value. So you can have zero, one, two, three, etc. But the idea of the interaction is basically on and off. I mean, you activate or inactivate the different different parts. And depending on this regulatory graph, you have you have a mathematical description of, of these interactions, and then you can look for the solutions. And when we talk about looking at the solutions of a Boolean model, we call we call this looking for the attractors of the system. So if you let this system evolve, where will it reach? So you can you have two kinds of, of solutions. You have a final states or stable states, and you have also limit cycles. So limit cycles, for instance, is when it doesn't it go, doesn't go out of a subgraph. So uh, usually in biology, we, we like a lot stable states. I mean, we like either death, either life, either you go through these pathways in order to reach death, etc. But sometimes also you may be interested into working with uh, with the with the limit cycles, which for instance is the cell cycle. Usually, if, if a cell doesn't have anything to stop it, it just keeps dividing, keeps dividing, keeps dividing, which is what happens, for instance, with algal blooms in, in some lakes. So, I mean, they keep dividing until, until they exhaust all the resources and then they die. But until they exhaust, I mean, they keep dividing. So, this, this you, could, you could simulate this as a limit cycle. So, yeah, so whenever I talk about phenotypes, what I'm talking is about, is about final states or, or stable states. So what we call phenotypes is these cell growth, cell dies, or apoptosis, necrosis, etc. So this is uh, th these are two examples of different models that we have been working throughout the years. So uh, I mean, as you see, I mean there are different nodes that are activated that are inhibited. The, the density of edges depends a lot on who built the, the model because all these models were built manually, in which uh, you have you have someone deciding that that these nodes should appear and these nodes should not appear or that these regulations should be there and, and should be integrated with this, et cetera, et cetera. There are ways to know, uh, or there are ways to assess if you should have an AND or an OR in this node, depending on the sensibility it has with the final, with the final output, et cetera. I mean, this is there, there are several ways of working with, with, these, with these Boolean models in order not to be, not to be blinded by, by the complexity and say, no, no, just put everything and, and let the system evolve. No, 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 I mean, you need to, do, to make some decisions. But the nice way of this is that this is a convenient way to model regulatory and signaling pathways, because this allows integration of literature and, and heterogeneous data. The, the, the problem is that all these omics data that we were talking before, none of them is quantitative, or very few of them is quantitative. Most of them is semi-quantitative. I mean, you just normalize to a prior state or to a wild type or to a, a normal state. So depending, I mean, you say that this mutant is, is different because it's different from a, from a reference they have. So, this uh, this kind of, of model can provide you some kind of qualitative analysis. Okay, so for instance, if I have a mutant that is has this mutated, then I simulate without muta muta with mutation and without mutation, and I compare the different phenotypes, and I see that that I don't know. For instance, cell cell uh, growth has just gone to the roof. Then I would say that this mutant is pro proliferative. I mean, it, it's increasing the chance of having this proliferation in cancer. So uh, this is the kind of like truth table that we work with, uh, in which uh, here I mean I mean black is one and, and white would be zero, in which you have the depending on the values of the inputs, you have different values for internal states and different values for the outputs, and of course uh, so here each each line is one of the variables and each column is one of the one of the stable states. Here I have organized them. I mean when 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 I analyze or when we analyze the the, the truth table, you see that that those four go together because they go to cell cell deaths. And so we call this apoptosis or it goes to survival of the cell, etc. I mean, you can organize the phenotypes in different, in different groups that make sense to you. So this is, let's say, the, the typical way of analyzing Boolean, Boolean models. So again, I mean, you have all the cells are going to apoptosis or all the cells are going to, to necrosis depending on the input states. So in 2012 at, at, uh, at Emmanuel's group, they started working with a way of having an intermediate simulation of uh, between Boolean and ODEs. So let's say that le something that gives me some semi-quantitative uh, simulation that I don't need the amount of parameters that I need for ODEs, but that, that, that but it's still a bit more fine-grained than that pure Boolean model. And for this, they work with a continuous time Markov process on the Boolean transition state space. What does this mean? This, this is very easy. So imagine that you have this toy model, A, B, and C. Okay, 
So you represent you represent how the model state, which is this a, this box here, evolves in time, and you see that all the edges lead you to be zero zero zero. I mean, no matter where you start, no matter what combination of ABC you start, it goes to zero zero zero. But maybe the way it goes to zero 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 is important to you. Maybe it's not the same that it just it just wiggles a bit here and then it goes here. That is jumps it jumps from from down to there, etc. So, <coughs> so what we have is we run trajectories in this in this space. So you start in a given point or you start at random, and then you let the system evolve and you see how the trajectories are reaching this zero zero zero, and then you gather the probabilities of these trajectories. So this gives you uh, uh, so for each Boolean state you have an associated probability, and you have this because you have different rates of change. So you have a parameter that that leads that for for a to go from zero to one or for one to zero. So you have a rate up for a and a rate down for a, and the same for b and for c. So for each one of the variables, you have a rate up and a rate down, and this uh, uh, this you can organize in the, in the way you want. But the idea is that this gives you some kind of of some some uh, notion of probability or, or of stochasticity, let's say, that maybe not all the cells go to cell death, but maybe eighty percent of the cells go to cell death. Because maybe you start with random initial conditions, and then some of them they go to to life uh, to to life uh, uh, proliferation status, whatever. So now, thanks to thanks to Mavos, now we can study perturbations, so the presence or absence of a given node, in a probabilistic manner, and this this allows us, for instance, to work with knockdowns or also to work with those such experiments. So let's let's say I have a I have a model, I have a cell, and I added thirty percent of nutrients, not hundred percent, but thirty percent. What does it happen? Maybe you see some transient, some transient behavior until you get to the stable state. So, if you want more information on this, you have these uh, these two papers here that, that talk with about about the Mavos. So, the, in 2012, it was the presentation of the tool, and in 17, they did like a second version of Mavos, Mavos 2. But the the idea the, the idea is the following: you start with a given set of inputs that can go from zero to 100 percent. Let's say you have nutrients 50%, but also growth factor 50%, but carcinogen 10%, for instance. You have these thousands of stochastic trajectories, and then you gather the phenotype, the, the stable states probabilities, you gather them at the end. And you can compare that, OK, I mean, if I have this mutation here, then the probabilities change. And I can compare semi-quantitatively, I can compare uh, the given mutation uh, in respect with the, with the wild type. So in this case, for instance, these two examples of this uh, small model in which I have all inputs to random initial conditions. And I see that most of them, they go to the naive, let's say survival state, is this green, this green uh, line here. But if I force an, an, an initial condition to one, then I see that apoptosis goes up. So you have much more apoptosis, but it's not everything goes to apoptosis. I mean, I have, I have there a, 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 some, some a bit more fine grade analysis that, okay, I mean, this has increased 40% apoptosis, but you could, have, you could have other mutants or you could have other initial conditions where you have increased 60% or it goes to 100% of apoptosis. And this is the way that we can analyze different mutants. I mean, you can browse all the mutants in a given model and say, okay, this bunch of mutants lead the model to apoptosis. And this bunch of mutants lead the, way, they lead the model to, to, no, to uh, no cellular death, et cetera. And then another thing that we can do, but I won't go, I won't go much, uh, sorry, yeah. Another thing that we can, that, that we can work, in, work with drugs or with dosages of, of things. Imagine that you, can, you have an inhibition of a given node to 50%. So I, I have a drug that inhibits 50% of the pro, of the proteins I have in the cell. So I can I can do this, uh, you know, like, like like continuous activation of the node, in which I can look at the phenotype effect of having this node to 80% or 25% or whatever. And this I can do also with combinations. I mean, I can I can combine the activations of two different nodes, and then I can work with combinations of drugs, for instance, combination of dosages of drugs. And yeah, then the last thing, the last thing that we can that we can do with with Mavos is personalize the models. So with with these different variables that I was talking about, the parameters going up and down, we can tell we can we can get some kind of data on, on RNA, for instance. And depending on the on the amount of RNA that I have for a given protein or for a given for a given gene, uh, to um, to have to have it like the, the, to make it more probable that the protein will be activated if they have a lot of RNA. And if I have just few RNA, it will be harder for that protein to get to get folded and get, get active. And uh, having having these different omics data, you can you can personalize personalize uh, the different models. For instance, this was done in, in this is prostate cell lines, yes. Uh, different prostate cell lines in which we had the omics data for the different prostate cell lines. And you have here the values of the different scores of the different outputs. 
and you see that, that you have some variability with the same model that you have personalized using just the data. So it's, let's say the same uh, main model, but that you have that you have like shifted the probability space so that it captures a bit better the different the different characteristics of the different cell lines. And we see that there are more invasive cell lines, we have less invasive cell lines, etc. Okay, so uh, now I, I, I wanted to go a bit more deep into, into PhysiBoss, how we have integrated this Mabos inside inside PhysiCell, in which the, the main idea is that we use we use PhysiCell as uh, in order to update the cells and to update, of course, the, the environment. And this, this updating of cell and environment informs my boss of what are the inputs of the model. I mean, what, what is, I mean, if, if nutrients is 50% or nutrients is 100% or is 0%, et cetera. With, this, uh, with these inputs known, then we run, uh, we run, we run my boss, we run the given, a given run of, of using my boss as a library. And then we output the different, the, I mean, the output of my boss will be the different values of the different outputs. And this, we do something with it in PhysiCell. So with the with the updated state, we do something else downstream uh, inside the phenotype of um, of uh, physics cell. So you can imagine that, for instance, if you have if you have uh, you do a cancerous a cancerous cell that doesn't have nutrients in order to divide, so nutrients will be zero, proliferation will be zero, and then you will not go forward into the cell cycle of physics cell, for instance. Or the other way around, you have lots of lots of nutrients, the proliferation will be on, and then you will feed these into physics cell, and then you will move to you will move forward in the cell cycle. Of, of physical. So you can imagine that there are there are I mean, there are many ways of connecting these these different inputs and outputs. And of course different people will do it in, in a different way that matches their, their focus or what they want out of this out of this modeling. So the, 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 the main idea is that cells that are in different in different places in the tumor spheroid in this case will have different inputs. Imagine that that we have rain of nutrients. So does these cells will be will be closer to nutrients but the bottom cells will not. So you can you may have different states in the internal in the internal signaling networks depending on the activations of the different of the different inputs of the model. And importantly, I was talking before about time scales. Importantly, we're working of a new in a new uh, delta t, with the, which is what we call delta t signaling, uh, which is bigger than the than the cell processes one. So cell processes uh, in in the in, in the config in the config I, I use usually uh, cell processes are each six minutes and the signaling is ten minutes. So let's say that that I mean you can you can move around you can diffuse etc. But you will only take decisions in terms of signaling pathways each ten minutes of simulation. So um, this uh, this framework allows for for genetic heterogeneity. So of course, I mean imagine that they have two different Boolean models that are slightly different, and I put together these different cell strains into one spheroid, like like it happens here. So here in yellow you have wild type, and you have in different colors you have different mutants. And of course, there will be some mutants that will be more prone to proliferation and others that will be less prone to proliferation. And you can also have different physical properties. I mean, imagine that you have a, a, a mutant that the, the only difference it has with its neighboring cell strain is that the cell cell attachment is much tighter than the other one. And you let this evolve and you see that you at the end, you, you see that you have different patches of cells that are tightly coupled together with, with because of the RD cell strain and others that are a bit more, a bit more loose. But we can also play with different tumor architectures. So we, in, for this, uh, we can, uh, we can, in order to simulate extracellular matrix, uh, we have tinkled a bit. I mean, this is not something that 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 we have worked a lot. And in fact, uh, Marco is is currently is currently uh, working on this. Is with how do we represent extracellular matrix and how the the interaction between the thickness of the extracellular matrix affects the different kinds of invasion that we have that that, that, that we're showing before in the in the figure there. So uh, we can either have like inert agents that are just lying around and the cells can push, which is what you have here on the left, or we can have, we can have, uh, we can determine the extracellular matrix thickness of all the voxels. So you will have different voxels and maybe you can have like avenues in order to facilitate the cells to go out, or you can see, you can have, for instance, like rod shape uh, enclosures of cells, etc. And, and this we can do on 3D and also we can do on, on 2D, like we want one cell thick monolayer. That, that, that's a mouthful. Yeah. So this was for, for the different genetical heterogeneities and environment, but also we can, I mean, as you know, we can have dynamical environments. So we can have different kinds of diffusions of oxygen and glucose. And also we can have a, like pulses of drugs. So we can have like, like you don't, you don't put like, like forever. I mean, a drug that, that starts in time zero and then it just staying there. 
but you can have like short bursts of like additions of drugs. And this is something that, that I will talk in, in, in the slide, which is, I mean, it is one of the results of the paper, which is very, very nice. And then also, of course, as, as I said before, we can work with combinations of drugs. So you can have different drugs that affect different nodes in the model, and you can play around with, okay, I mean, this drug doesn't affect, but then when I add this second drug, it does affect, which is what happens here. So if I have a drug that, that, that targets AKT, I see that the green, the green curve, which is the cells proliferating, the alive cells, they are just staying at the top. But then if I add a second drug, and only if I add a second drug, I will see this synergy effect in which you have the ne uh, necrosis, apoptosis in this case. The, the cell death just spiked and then it killed it killed all the cells that were present in the simulation and that's it. So we can have the, like this kind this kind of, of simulations in which we combine we combine drugs that are diffusing in some way in the environment with affecting different differently in the Boolean in the Boolean model. So the work with TNA TNA was a bit like a showcase of example that we use in the in the bioinformatics paper from from 20, uh, 2018. Uh, in which uh, this was uh, we took we took uh, parameters from from a paper that had like 15, 15 years ago something like this, in which they they work with with different pulses. So they, they took cells and then they add different different drugs for a given time and then they remove the drug. So uh, we wanted to simulate this. So what we did is like okay, I mean imagine that we don't have we don't have uh, uh, this drug that is called TNF. TNF. That I mean in in this case we use it as a drug. So if you don't have the drug, the identity cells just divide, and that's it. But what is what it has been described, and in fact, this is one of the reasons why why it's not is not used uh, much into into clinical um, clinical um, uh, trials, is because when whenever you add TNF or whenever you force TNF to be produced in a tissue, you have like this burst of apoptosis, and then you have the cells that are completely completely uh, of, um, they, they are completely uh, 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 blind. To the to the new TNF to the, the new TNF value, for for instance, here we have addition of TNF. Then you have the red cells, which is cell dying. They go up, and then you still have some green cells that are divided. In fact, when you increase the concentration of TNF, you, you still have the same the same behavior. So you see that the cells go up, and then they keep going up. This is because of how how the TNF is wired inside the Boolean model. So you have a feedback loop that whenever well, you have two processes that TNF starts, one is cell death, and the other is cell proliferation. And depending on the velocity of, of this of the, of these different these different paths, it can either go to cells resisting and proliferating or to cell death. And what we found is that there is there is a given frequency in which you can add the pulses of TNF at a given frequency. And what you get is that the cells that are alive they just keep keep going to zero until they are dead. Of course, I mean I mean ideally we would like to to check this into with with cell lines, but but we had we had not. Not a chance to convince experimentalists to check this, but the but the idea is that you take advantage of the different of the different dynamics of the system, in order to um, uh, promote the trajectories that go to cell death, and not uh, and inhibit or, or 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 put it a bit more difficult to the trajectories that go to cell proliferation, because of because of this of this feedback loop that you have, and because TNF activates both, but they go at different speeds because we have different parameters as, as I was saying before, we have different activation parameters. So, yeah. So, so we do actually have a question, Arno. if you have a moment for it. Yes, oh. yes, sure, sure, but, I can. Uh, so this is from John Metzgar. He says, so do you pre-assign the probabilities of achieving a state and then determine the rates of change based on the final state probabilities? Or do you find the probabilities by running MOBOS, which must have pre-assigned transition probabilities for each node? Yes, so um, if, if I have data, I, I, I'd rather use data. So if I have, if I have, I mean, if I want to, if I want to tackle a given experiment and I have some kind of, of protein concentration or if I have a transcription of, of a given of a given gene, I would I would rather use that as a proxy of the of the rate uh, rather than 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 fixing it for a given for a given phenotype. Uh, but but that's me. I mean, other people uh, can 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 do it in other way. I mean, for instance, in this TNF. What they had is like like two levels of node because some nodes represent uh, RNA and other nodes represent proteins. So they they it is known that that the that the step between between gene and protein is much much slower than the one between gene and RNA. So they had like like two different two different levels of activation, and they assign different nodes to the different levels of activation. But but again, I mean this uh, this is uh, yeah this is this, this depends a lot on on how you want to model or what you want to model in a sense. 
but of course, I mean, you could imagine that, that you know, uh, maybe 95% of the parameters because you have some data, but maybe for the other 5%, you don't know. Maybe it would be good to just have like a naive uh, value of the parameter and then fix it with, with whatever phenotype you want, you want to have or you're getting. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you as you were just getting to no, this no, amazing no. punchline here. <clears throat> yes, yes, this is this is different different examples of feasibles that we had had in in, in the in, in our group in, in the in the past in the past years. But but yeah, I mean, this is just to showcase the, the different the different kinds of simulation that, that 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 we and you can do, of course. And uh, yeah, so for the last. For the last part of the of the talk, I wanted to to go to the code. I mean, I wanted to to, to let people see the code. Let's say, so um, this is this is part of the code that that you can you can look at in this uh, in this link is in this link here. Uh, uh, but I mean, the, the code that I will show is up to date with the 1.9 version that that has been recently uh, recently uh, done in in Fizzle, the release. So I mean, whatever you see here, uh, it is in the in the Fizzicell um, into the in the Fizzicell, uh, release 1.9. So um, the idea is that uh, how how do we how do we code this? I mean, what is what is the way that that we connect from C cell to whatever we do uh, inside an agent, and from the agent to whatever it is done in the in the cell in the cell code. So in order to do this, I will use I will use this uh, this uh, this model from from Miguel Ponce that comes that you can you can see a bit more of the of the model in this in this archive uh, preprint. Uh, but the the kind of modeling that that Miguel did has like two different parts. One, we have um, uh, the receptor dynamics in which you have TNF that is arriving to its receptor. Both of them are getting into the cell and then the receptor is going out to the membrane. And then the, the, this, this TNF bound to TNF receptor does something to, to the Boolean model. And then you have the Boolean model, which is the one that I showed before with the TNF and with the different the three different uh, phenotypes of proliferation, apoptosis, and, and necrosis. So, as, as the idea is to touch uh, as, as few uh, classes in, in the core functions of physical as, po as possible, what, you usually, what, what we usually do is work with the custom modules. So uh, we do this with, with different samples in, with, in which you have, for instance, here we'll talk about this spheroid TNF uh, model in which uh, we have different config files. And then we have in custom models, we have all the code that will use this config file and that will interface with different uh, classes in, in, in the physical code. So we have, for instance, custom CPP, which is let's say the structural functions, or, or let's say the more, the more housekeeping functions. Uh, then we have the, the, in this case, we have a submodel data structure because you have like these two different submodels because you have Boolean model and we have all these. And then we have the interface between between the Boolean model and the 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 physical the physical itself. And then you have uh, also a file a CPP file of ODE dynamics. So if you want, if you're interested into how this is being modeled, you can go to here. If you're interested more on the interaction, you can go to the interface and uh, etc. But uh, yeah, we'll just I will just have like a, a very let's say top level or, or, or medium level uh, um, uh, analysis of this. So in this case, we're looking at the TNF Boolean model interface. So how our custom classes will interface with uh, with physical with physical main main classes or core classes. So in order to do this, uh, we have we have different we have different functions like the, the, the interface setup. We have also the, the update the Boolean model inputs. So how we will change the Boolean the Boolean model inputs depending on the values that are that are being fed by by physical environmental values, for instance, or uh, contact uh, cell to cell contact values, etc. And then uh, we will update the Boolean model. So we will run we will run my boss. And then at the end we will we have this main loop that just like gathers gathers the the the, the other the other um, functions. So for instance, in this in this um, TNF VM interface main, what you have what you have it was here. So we first update the Boolean model inputs. Then what we do is we update the do we run my boss basically. I mean with the new with the new input vectors we just uh, we just make a run of my boss and then we gather the outputs. And with this, we um, update the self fate based on the Boolean output. So depending on, on what outputs you have, then you change that the cell will, is going to divide. So promote self, uh, self cycle or uh, go into apoptosis, et cetera. So uh, yeah, th these are some examples, for instance, in which we are updating the self from the Boolean model. So for instance, whenever, uh, where, where, oh, yes. so whenever uh, apoptosis 
uh, we modify, for instance, the apoptosis, um, the apoptosis value, depending on the value of the apoptosis node of the cell or of, of the Boolean model. Or the necrosis comes from this non-ACD uh, mode, or survival for us is this, is this um, survival node. And depending if this is true or not, we promote some things or other. For instance, we start death if the apoptosis is on, or we start necrosis if <clears throat> the necrosis is on, or if we are we are if we are uh, if we are proliferating and the current phase index is the one that it should, then we're promoting it into cell cycle. I mean, if you're in G zero, then what you get is you just you just advance into the into the following into the following phase. And, and so on and so forth. Yes, with an NF kappa B is just that you produce. So there is this, this feedback loop that I was talking before is that TNF activates a protein that is called NF kappa B that in turns is promoting TNF. So here, what you, what you do is that whenever this node is on, then you do something which is have more external TNF in the, in the simulation. So whenever you run, whenever you run this function, you get you get these different these different return values and then you do in physical cell you do something with uh, with this for instance you promote apoptosis or or, or whatnot <laughs> then also we have some uh, some monitor variables that that it, for us they are interesting in order to track the simulation so for instance we have some nodes internal nodes of the model we get them out uh, in the in the code in order I mean, we made we made, we made them public so that we can then plot them in the in the in the output we, we have them in the output data of physical cell and we're able to, to plot it, which is these, these three different nodes. And yeah, I think I have a figure out later on that we talk about that I talk about this. And then if you're interested into, into the, the Boolean model inputs, how, how this is how this is done. I mean, basically we, we have we talk about the external, the sorry, the bound external TNF receptor. So this this little TNF with TNFR that was in the model that was activating all the all the Boolean model before. And then what we get is we have a threshold of activation. So if you're above the threshold, you activate the, the node. And if you're below the threshold, you don't activate the node. This, of course, we can discuss if the threshold should be 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 or 0 0.75. Maybe for that, it's good to have some kind of, of experimental value that you can check, depending on the concentration of TNF, what was the, 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 the behavior of the cells. In this sense, it, 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 I mean, we, use, we use data in order to validate for these parameters whenever it's possible. Sometimes it's not. It's not uh, is not possible but in this case uh, in fact miguel uh, added here the doi of the paper where he took these different values so that if you're interested into checking into checking this threshold you can you can go back you can go back to the paper which is which is always nice and then uh, of course we have this uh, this custom file which is which is the one where uh, where we have uh, where we where we determine a bit like like the different the different functions in which uh, let's say the housekeeping functions i would say like the setup tissue creates cell types set up a microenvironment the update monitor variables etc 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 i mean depending on on what what you want to what you want to address you will have here different different functions of course and then uh, in the, the only thing that has been, that has changed in order for this to work inside physicel is this intracellular class which is in this file core physicel phenotype file in here you have this intracellular in which you have different functions in order for you to, in our case, it's uh, specific to Boolean models or specific to my boss, in which depending, sometimes we need to get a Boolean variable, sometimes we need to set a Boolean variable. We, we need to maybe to ask if, if this variable is present in the model, or for instance, we need to get out of the, the, the nodes that are active in the, in the model. But this, uh, for instance, if you want, if you want to use ODEs with Roadrunner, you will have different functions. Uh, but the idea is that is that having this intracellular class, we want like to accommodate uh, most, if not if not all, of the uses that you could have with with physical with with different formalism that you may be that you might be interested in. And uh, yeah, and then of course we have some kind of settings in which uh, in which we have this intracellular key, which is here. Which in this case there's only there's only the definition of the different models of the of my boss, uh, which is uh, like um, a boolean network uh, file and then a config file as is internal of my boss. But uh, yeah, so this uh, just using this key, I mean you you are you are saying the to physical to go to this model and then and then upload this model and then and then simulate it. So and also there are some functions that the, for instance the function that we saw before about set a boolean variable allows you to modify the model. So no matter what the model the, what the model has uh, has addressed the value of a for instance you can modify the value of a to one to zero or to what is of your interest. 
And yeah, so this is this is, for instance, uh, some some uh, simulation that that Miguel did with uh, using Pop Ray, in which you, what you see is this temporal timeline here on the right. You see it a bit in a in a video, which is uh, which is yeah, it's usually nicer nicer to show and, and to see really the the three D the three D effect of this. And um, yeah, so for instance, some of these some of these monitor variables that I was saying before. For us, they are very, very important because what we want is to plot the internal state of the agent. And in order to do this, we can use monitor variables and also we can use custom data. So this custom data, you, you write it in the config file in which uh, what, 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 uh, what you consider that, that it should, uh, you, you, you are interested in tracing these different variables. And then you can then plot things like this in which you, you are tracing different these different variables and also the different the different monitor variables that you have defined before uh, in, in some kind of like line uh, temporal temporal analysis of what's happening inside inside the agents because of course if else you're using you're using this as a black box and sometimes it's very complicated for debugging etc so yeah just a few few uh, slides and, and and i'm i'll finish about uh, drug synergies so this uh, in this case we we have been working with frequencies of drugs I mean, until now, but, but now what, what we were interested is into having like different drugs arriving to the same agent and doing something to the model. So uh, for this, uh, we had, I mean, I work with, uh, with a master student called Danica, Anika Mert, in which what she did was to take uh, all the, let's say the, the dose, um, drug dose response uh, um, um, functions such as this one. And we, what, you, what you have is the cell, the cell viability in accordance to the different concentration of drug. And these, you have databases that, that have this for many, many, many different cell lines and for many, many drugs in which you have experimental values and you have, you have a sigmoid that is fitted to these different experimental values in order to know if a cell has survived or not the, the given addition of a, of a concentration of drug. So taking this with this, uh, pro, uh, this uh, prostate, prostate uh, model, uh, what she did was to simulate several drugs and to, to see how the addition of the drugs was uh, was killing the cells or was promoting the cells, etc. And these you can you can see. I mean, this is done in physibos. I mean, those curves comes from physibos, and you can see that the different concentration of the drug diminish the proliferation of the of the cells, which of course makes sense. I mean, if a drug is used because in this case it was it was clinically tried drugs, if a drug is being used is because it, it's working, of course. And and this you can do for for single drugs, but you can also combine the different the different concentration of drugs. So in this case, what you do is in the environment, you add different concentration of drugs. You let the you let physio simulate, and then you gather you gather the you gather the the final the final output results, and then you do some kind of analysis in order to have a growth index of in this case it's just the AUC with drug divided by the AUC without drug, and you can study the different the different effects of different, of different drugs, and for instance in this case is the bliss uh, the bliss independence, if the combination of drugs has a higher effect than each of the of the drugs by, by themselves. And uh, this was for gastric cell lines in which using Eugene Fizibos, we basically tally the results that we have with Maboss, which uh, uh, itself were, were uh, matching the result that they had on the original paper. So in a sense, we see that, that, that we are kind of like validating the results in the same that we have the same results with one or the other. The huge difference here is that here the, in, in the, the, first, the two first, we're simulating one single, one single cell. And in this case, in the third one, we're simulating a bunch of, of populations of cells. So you can have also some kind of environmental effect that, of course, we want to study. We want to study now. So um, last but not least, we're also working right now in the in the using PhysiCell in different nodes. So in order to be able to use to use all the body nostrum in order to simulate to simulate this. So for instance, as you know, PhysiCell right now uses shared memory parallelization, but what we want is distributed memory. So on top of OpenMP, what we want is to add MPI, and for this, what what we're what we're working is in distributing the domain of simulations between different nodes, so that in this case they are like imagine like sandwiches slices. So when whenever you move in one of the dimensions, you're moving across different nodes on, on the supercomputer, but if you move in the other two, you're just moving across in one in one single node. So uh, this we were worried that the that the different domain partitioning and the message the message interface between the different the different nodes would affect somehow. The results of the of the simulation and what we see is that we have exactly the same results with a hybrid with a hybrid uh, code and then with the, the with the pure open MP. so let's say the the classical physical cell with the physical cell with a physical mpi or or by a vm mpi so 
in this case, the, the, the idea of having these huge simulations is in order to allow for bigger, more complex simulations. So that, for instance, we, we, we just tried to have 400 substrates with one of the nodes our, our, in our supercomputer. And we get we run out of memory with so much substrates. I mean, the, the data matrices that you need to that you need to solve are too big for the memory to to handle. So using two nodes, I mean, using twice as much as much computing power and having some some kind of interface between the different nodes, we're able to simulate 400 and even 800 substrates with the given with the same with the same uh, uh, box simulation box. And yeah, so this is this is for uh, what we call by FEM X. And now we're testing PhysiCell X, which will be the MPI implementation of, of PhysiCell. So now between the domains, what we want is not only to, to communicate the different values of the diffusion of the diffusion uh, voxels, but as well, hey, here is a cell that is moving from my domain to your domain. I mean, take care of it or whatever. And this is something that, that, that we're currently doing. And as you see here, I mean, the, the results are, are basically the same. I mean, they are, they are basically matching one another. And yeah, we're we're doing this on 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 this project that is called Permit COE, which is a three-year project that started in October. So we'll be developing this for at least a couple more years, and I hope that many more. But let's say that we get we got funded for two more years, so which is which is nice. And uh, yeah, that, this this I can skip maybe if we want to have questions. But yeah, the idea is is just that we want to have more more different cells, like like you guys did for for the paper for the 2018 paper. And we want also to, uh, I mean, one of the ideas that, that Miguel had was to incorporate uh, flux balance analysis inside those agents so that the, the metabolic state of the, of the model will lead to the different, the different growths of the cells, which is something that, that he, he's been, he has been working for, for some time. And, and we hope that, that it will be, it will be finished, finished soon so that we can publish it. So the idea would be that at the end, what you can you can play around and you can combine different intracellular models in one single agent in order to to tally whatever whatever questions that will interest. So good. So this is my last my last slide. So of course, uh, many many acknowledgements for for Miguel uh, Ponce de Leon, which is my collaborator at BSC and also collaborators in in Institut Curie, such as Vincent Noel and, and Marco and, and also Laurence. And yeah, I mean, if you have any any question, any 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 doubt or, or or you want to talk with me, you can reach me by mail or by Twitter. And yeah, so this is this is our group when when there was no pandemic around and we could gather for a photo shoot. <laughs> but, but currently we, we have we have changed a bit. So some people have, have left, many have come. So the, the group is a bit bigger right now. So yeah, thank you very much for, for your attention and, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Everyone just join me in giving Arnoa a hand, a, a big round of applause. That's an amazing tour de force. And also amazing that it was in one hour. <laughs> because that was an incredible tour of, 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 the, of, of the breadth of work that you've been doing. I am just blown away by the MPI extensions. Mm -hmm. And of course, the integration with the metabolic modeling is, is a, a, a deep topic of interest for many of the people in the workshop today. Uh, so I really do hope that they will uh, give it a go to try out the intracellular code. And mm -hmm. I want to point out that Business Cell 190 was released with a humongous push of work and help from Arnaud, from Vincent, from Marco, and, and many on the team there uh, yes. to finally take Physiboss, which had kind of grown in parallel to Business Cell after one, it's like 1.0, we kind of branched out. And they developed Physiboss as an extension of Business Cell 10. And then Business Cell kept developing and they grew apart for a bit. And then we finally got to the grand merge in Physical Cell 1.0, oh, where it all works and it all works together. It's cross-platform and it's just beautifully integrated. <laughs> and and it's, it's very exciting. And I hope you all do give that a look. Uh, Arno, are there any special notes they need to know for and uh, for compiling the sample of Physiboss project? Uh, no, I think no, no. I think it's I mean it's running. I mean the 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 project the project here that I that I showed before. It's uh, it's on the main. I mean, you can go to the to Epa. You can go here and you can just compile it. I mean, there's no there's no special compilation. I mean, apart from from the couple of lines of my boss, which is we. I mean, we know that it works uh, in, in 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 all the OSs that we need. And yeah, and I mean, you, you can already get some kind of results like like the ones I showed. Very cool. And is this one of the bundled sample intracellular models then for Con yes. and Marco? I think so, so the neat thing is you don't even have to go to Physiboss to grab 
some of these sample models thing. You you should be able to type make list projects. And ah. this, you know, there I know there is a Mopos or Physiboss yes. project that shows as a sample intracellular project. Or it's already bundled with the download. Yes, it's but may, maybe it's this one. Maybe it's physical yeah. cell lines. Yeah. I don't know. Marco, do, and, you, do uh, you remember? Yes, it is. It is physical okay. cell, cell lines. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's the cell lines. Yeah, but but I mean, you can you can just take this you can just take this uh, this folder and just copy it there. I mean, it should work because I mean they are basically the same the same code. Brilliant. And the idea, the idea is that is that those, in a way, those folders are plug and play in the sense that that the only interface they have with the main the main physical um, core code is the intracellular class. So it should be it should be feasible. So it's just brilliantly well engineered, uh, and, and I believe you guys have been using this also in the disease map project. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So we have. Yes. So we have. Um, I mean, also we also incorporate. Yeah, the, the, there was no time to talk about COVID in this in this presentation. But but yeah, yeah, the idea is is to take uh, to take the the work that you guys have done on on physical COVID or or physical for COVID, and um, and plug it in with with my boss and having different Boolean models of epithelial cells of immune cells, etc. So again, I mean, the 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 motivation is the same, and we want to combine environmental perturbations with genetic perturbations in order to have some. Uh, some interesting some interesting results oh that's terrific and maybe we'll have to have you all come back and speak more specifically on that yes, sometime. Yes. i think after this workshop winds down and we've all had a chance to catch our breath i think it would be <laughs> good to start some kind of a virtual physicist cell seminar series okay. where some of the projects that use physicist cell or physiboss uh can have an opportunity to kind of share the results and, and go and go even deeper in on some of the results so i think maybe it'd be great to have some of you i mean i mean the, the disease map work that you folks have been involved in is some of the most amazing COVID-19 modeling I've mm -hmm. seen to date. And uh, yeah. you know, I think it'd be great at some point if we actually merged what we've been leading with our coalition with yours, I think it would just be absolutely uh, gobsmackingly brilliant uh, to combine it all together. And so we, we're working towards getting kind of our coalition paper out. And then of course, you guys have your preprint that you've been putting out and then we should do another grand merge. So it, it's yes. just really exciting to see the community science popping out with these frameworks. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes. So uh, are there any questions for Arno? Yes, I see here a question if PhysiSelect is available to play with. So not currently, we're, we're debugging. Uh, we are, in fact, we have we have the, the, the main, the MPA engineer, which have helped uh, help us we bring, uh, I mean, with the domain partitioning by RVM. Uh, he's been he's working right now with the new, with, there are some new uh, functions that have changed from 1.8 to 1.9. So we're mm -hmm. now, we're now like like keeping keeping update with 1.9 and once once we have that, uh, we, will, we will try to release it, yeah, as soon as, soon as possible. The thing is that, is that I'm very, I'm very, very eager to, to just use like all the nodes or half of the nodes <laughs> available. From the supercomputer in order to, to just see how many how many cells we can we can we can work with, but uh, but yeah and in any case in any case the code should be self-contained. I mean the only the only uh, added um, requirement is just that that, that you have the, the MPA library, which most clusters have. I mean this is something that is quite quite standard. So yeah, I mean the idea is that that, that many people should be able to use it. That's terrific. That's going to be a keen interest. The other thing we need to do is we need to introduce you to uh, Sunita Chandrasekharan, who is a wonderful uh, researcher, and particularly the Open ACC community we work with at University okay. of Delaware. And she's been doing yes. GPU and Open ACC acceleration on the NVIDIA hardware of the diffusion solver. Okay. And so wow. I think down the road, it, I think we need to be looking towards a full hybrid model where you have the open uh, MP, MPI hybrid, of course. So you have open MP on one node and the MPI connected many nodes together for the distributed computing. And then on single nodes, you also integrate the open ACC acceleration of the diffusion components. And so uh, her lab has been leading that and we're moving towards a preprint on that really, really soon. And I think it'd just be brilliant to merge these yes. together. Yes. Uh, we've also thought about uh, kind of like a, a, a quasi squunk works project where we are trying to kind of do a, a you know, maybe this is physicist cell 3.0 or something, um, but replacing the agents with something more basic that lives almost entirely on the GPU, where all the mechanics and diffusion secretion uptake happen on GPU accelerated basic agents, 
And then those that information feeds up into what we would call agents right now that keep track of the overall cell phenotype. So the complicated stuff lives on the bigger agents. The basic core operations live on the GPU. And, and the neat thing then is, uh, of course, as you've showed with the time steps, the diffusion time step is the fastest one happens all the time where really most of the work is happening as you've seen in the code profiling. And then the mechanics is probably the next one up. And then, so like for every, for every one mechanics time step, there's by default 10 diffusion steps. And for every one cell phenotype step, there are like 60 mechanics steps or 600 diffusion steps. So keeping diffusion mechanics on the graphics card will keep a lot of computation away from the CPU, which will, I think, really be exciting to see accelerated. Uh, and that I think is opening the possibility we're trying to get to a point where we actually do subcellular elements with the, uh, the computational gains from the GPU. Uh, so there are a lot of exciting things we could talk about merging these architectures in the future. Yeah. Um, we need to write yeah. some kind of mega grant. <laughs> No, and, and, and also from, from what I gather from, from, from people, let's say, calling the shots in, in supercomputer, uh, at least in this European European consortium, is that uh, they, are, they are basically pushing for, for GPUs, or at least heterogeneous, that you have nodes that have CPUs and GPUs. So, I mean, uh, in, in, the next, in the next, yeah, five, seven years, I mean, we will need to, to, yeah, to, to just use those bigger calculators, right? <laughs> So that, yeah. that, of course, and I mean, th this will bring trouble, but also, I mean, it will accelerate many, many, many things that right now they are tedious. It's, it's going to be really cool when you start really, we all, you know, leverage all these unique strengths from these different, you know, teams and groups and, and put it together. Um, and, you know, like here, I'm, I'm sure the EU has similar, right? But like for the leadership class supercomputers here, uh, they don't even want you to let you on the computer if you aren't using the GPU, right? They're like, don't waste our time <laughs> with these non-GPU codes. Uh, don't waste <laughs> our resources. So we definitely want to look at that point where we put the whole thing together. Uh, so I'm, I'm so excited by this work. And again, I'm really grateful for your, pre you know, just a, a mind-blowing talk today. Uh, if there are any other, uh, uh, so let's give Arno a hand. Uh, I think we should probably give people a break and then we'll start the uh, the normal sessions for the workshop at 11 o'clock. Of course, Arno, you and your team are absolutely you know welcome to stay with us today or not. Mm -hmm. And um, you know we will be posting